thank you so much, Deanna, for joining me today and for being part of our Speaking Truth to Youth project. I have a few questions I want to ask. First of all, what in your youth inspired you or what beliefs or actions or moments inspired you to become an activist? I guess I would preface everything by saying I, I was born here in Southern California in Los Angeles, and I grew up to parents who they were pretty open open to creativity. My mom also was a singer and played piano. I always thought of myself as an artist. I became the kid in grammar school and then in junior high school who people would go to when they had to make a poster or a sign or do a drawing of something for a report or a project. I also was always very interested in the natural world. I my mom had a little vegetable garden and a rose garden, and I got really involved in helping plant seeds and grow food. I think I was in fifth grade when I grew my first big zucchini. I looked up a recipe and I scooped it out and I, I, I baked it and I filled it with stuff and I melted cheese on top of it and I made dinner for my family. And I was in fifth grade. And when I began university at UCLA, I, I applied and I started as a biology major. A part of that also came from while I was in middle school, my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer. And when I was in high school, she passed away. I really wanted to study biology because I wanted to do preventative cancer research. The feedback I was getting from people in my classes was that my drawings were excellent. And that had I ever considered becoming a scientific illustrator, and I would say, no, but you don't understand. I'm an artist. I'm also an artist. And it's, it's somehow in the world I grew up in, it wasn't cool to be an artist and a scientist. It was almost like you were one or the other. Let me just preface this by saying, now I meet young people all the time who are studying the arts at a science university. You know, they're, take, they're an art major at Caltech or at MIT. And I really think that there's magic in that place where art and science, and obviously for the work we do with Plastic Pollution Coalition, communications. I think that all artists are communicators. They're communicating feelings. They're communicating their perception of something, like how the world appears to them, or the world they'd like to see, or how you know how the world feels in a way. And when we look back historically, it's so important. Artists are so important. Photographers and painters and dancers and filmmakers and writers, because this creates the collective history of the culture of our time. I think coming at things as an artist, you come with a more open mind. Uh, when I, I, I became an art major, I was focused on painting. And after I graduated from university, I was painting. And I was lucky, I was doing kind of actually almost like botanical images of flies and spiders and insects not normally identified as being beautiful. And then I began making work with a kind of collage. I started deconstructing brown paper bags, which they were giving out at the market and finding that they had different numbers printed on the bottom of them sometimes. And I started deconstructing those, taking them apart, and then putting them back together in different ways to create kind of geometric paintings or collages with them, but I wasn't using any paint. And I was gluing them together and I was exploring different glues and I began to sew and add needle and thread as a drawing element to the pieces and use those to help bring the bags together. And then one day I added a plastic bag to a piece that I had been making with brown paper bags. And it was a particularly specific plastic bag in that I had gotten it from a pharmacy in Belgium, in Europe. Wow. And it had a botanical image of a dandelion printed on the side of it and the name written in Latin. And I thought to myself, when I looked at the bag, I thought this bag is so ironic. It's like a deep irony in taking a plastic bag, which I had no idea what it was made out of at the time, and printing a an image from nature on it. I cut up that bag, I sewed it into a piece with brown paper bags, and I just had this moment where I went, oh my gosh, plastic. It's so ubiquitous, it's everywhere, it's everywhere I go. So then I started taking 
bits and pieces of bags that I was finding or that were coming into my life or were shoved in a drawer somewhere or whatever. I started taking pieces of the bags, text that I found that was written on the bags, images that were printed on the bags and kind of cutting those up and putting them back together, either to make them say something that I wanted to say. Like I remember I made a piece that just said, no war, please. And I ended up making a piece that looked a little bit like an American, it, it looks actually very much like an American flag. So I began to make work out of plastic. And now really I've been making those pieces, I think for 35 years while I was working with the plastic after the first eight to 10 years, a few of the bags in some of my pieces started to break apart. When the pieces started to fissure and break apart, it was around the same time that I was starting to notice more plastic washed up in the ocean. We now realize that plastic was never designed to be recycled. The numbers that they print on plastic containers, one through six or one through seven, it just identifies the type of plastic. It actually, even though it has chasing arrows in that triangle, does not mean that it is recyclable and it doesn't mean that it's being recycled. Majority of our food and beverages and beauty products and healthcare products and cleaning products and every other thing that you could possibly want is packaged in plastic, if not made out of plastic. And a lot of our clothing is synthetic, especially for any kind of sports and sports teams. And plastic, 99% of plastic is made out of fossil fuels and petrochemicals. It's so funny that we want to move away from or divest from fossil fuels and let yet they're in everything. And really, frankly, to package our food in it, maybe perhaps makes them last longer. But at the same time, it means we're also ingesting microplastics and microfibers. Right. What guides you? What gives you hope or any courage? Or I wake up every morning and I feel really hopeful and really enthusiastic about this and the work that we're doing. And, you know, our mission is to raise awareness about the toxic impact of plastic and the chemicals in plastic, but it's also to create a more just, equitable, regenerative world free of plastic pollution and its toxic impacts. We ask that when you're looking at marine debris, litter, rubbish, waste, garbage, you don't use those words for it if it's plastic. You call it plastic and you call it plastic pollution. And then our other campaign was to take this 3R model that's taught in schools, the reduce, reuse, recycle model, which was nice. created by industry, to take yep. that and to add a fourth R onto the front, and that is refuse. And so to empower, especially young people, and ask them whenever possible to refuse plastic and single-use plastic. And that may mean that every time you order a drink anywhere, out in the world, you say, would it be possible to have that in a real glass? No straw, please. I don't want any straws in my drink, et cetera. And, you know, as a student, to get in the habit of regularly carrying a reusable cup, preferably a steel cup. And we have great resources, by the way, on our website at plasticpollutioncoalition.org. Uh, we have a get, whole Get Started page. We have single-use plastics explained. We work to educate, connect, and advocate. One is individual behavior change and helping support that. Two is what can we do in our schools? We help create plastic-free campuses. It's plasticfreecampuses.org. So if you want to get something going at your school, you could go take a look at that. But we also have coalition members that are just doing incredible projects. One of our members is called Ahimsa homeware and they've got a project that's called conscious cafeteria and they've just worked with 20 schools across the united states to shift their cafeteria to food grade steel lunch trays mm -hmm. and real utensils if you work in your own place of business or work look at how you how people eat and how can you shift to reusables and begin to normalize and move away from the single use mentality. And the single use mentality was really heavily marketed to us. I don't actually think that it's convenient. If you look at the impact to our health and the environment, water, air, soil, animals, it's actually not convenient at all. The other part of all of that is policy and legislation. 
and working with through legal channels, there are a lot of interesting lawsuits happening right now with young people suing the federal government or suing their state or their local government in Hawaii for not addressing climate change. One of the things everyone needs to realize is that all these big companies, and a lot of them will have contracts with your school to provide beverages like Coke or Pepsi or Nestle's, that a lot of these companies have worked very hard to move us to a single use mindset. Uh, but what you can do, for example, if you have a contract with one of those companies, your school does, you can put together a group of people who come back to the school and say, we want to switch everything in the cafeteria to the dispensers, oh, you know, right. like water hydration stations. That's one of the first things I think that should be made available to everybody is drinking fountains and hydration stations, which have filters that are regularly changed and maintained so that the water doesn't taste like something gross. We're involved in a couple piece, supporting a couple pieces of federal legislation. One is the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. Another is called the Right to Repair Act. How do we make it easier for people to repair things? And how do we hold companies and corporations accountable to take back their materials at the end of life? And then there's also a piece of international policy that we've been working on, which is called the UN Global Plastics Treaty. And so we have a petition that folks can sign that says asking the government, the US government to support a strong global plastics treaty. And I would love to help empower young people so that they feel like they have the power, the power to say no, the power to refuse plastic, the power to engage with managers at local markets where they might regularly shop with their family and say, we'd like to have the opportunity to buy more food unpackaged without all the plastic packaging, and also to learn how to go and speak up for what they believe in at city council meetings, uh, school council meetings, board meetings. And then, of course, the other thing that young people can do, because I think that they're more facile at this than, than adults, is they can use social media if they do use social media and they can talk about the things that they care about. I would say try and come together with a couple other friends or colleagues at school because it's easier to do when there's a few of you together. We have a project that's called Flip the Script on Plastics in Film and TV. There's a component to it on our website where you can access a form. And when you're watching a TV show, if you see reusables or hear a mention of something having to do with solutions to plastic pollution or something having to do with plastic pollution, you can submit it to our site. That's a really fun project. There is one other project, it's called Filtered Not Bottled. And it's based on the money that the Biden administration allotted to begin to change out all the lead pipes. What we encourage is we encourage cities to provide filters to people instead of people needing to go buy plastic bottled water. We have a couple pieces on our website blog posts that were written by either um, youth activists who are part of our coalition or um, have interned for us. And one wrote a really great piece about boba places, engaging with your local boba places and trying to encourage them to use real glass containers or accept uh, a reusable cup. Thank right. you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Have a great Bye. night.